First things first, we need to do some announcements. You're up. You're up. <laughs> Imagine that. Dun dun dun. Sorry, I wasn't there, 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 there before. Uh, uh, okay, so what, is there anybody that has not gotten this? Because I never got it last week, so. The back, back there. Okay, I'm going to start at the back. So, back folks, pass it forward. And then over to the outside section. All right, guys, I forgot to get it in the bulletin. It's my mistake. But on uh, February the 15th at 2 o'clock the Mid-Missouri Christian Choir rehearsals start again at First Baptist Church in Fulton this time so we've moved closer to here so I'd love to have you guys there um, there's no audition age 16 and up so 2 o'clock First Baptist Church in Fulton come sing in the choir awesome deal awesome deal all right um, let's see the next thing I need to talk about. Uh, it's coming up soon, February 7th. Um, last week I talked about needing to help Maryland move. Um, I've, we are going to have to do it on the 7th uh, in the morning. Um, so if you could please come see me or one of the keepers about helping out with that. We need vehicles. We need some cleaning, but we're going to have to do it on Saturday the 7th. Um, that way people who are not working has can help out. So please, it's coming up. I need your help. Vehicles, packers, cleaners, all that. All right? All right. The other thing is, too, is where is, he loves to be pointed out, where, where, where did, where did Josh Lacoco go? Where'd he go? There he is, Josh Lacoco. He is King Chili. <laughs> Uh, he won first place last week with the chili cook-off with not chili necessarily. It was chili lasagna, and it was really good, and he won first place. So thank you all for all that. Um, today, Conqueror Series is a different time because of the bowl. Bowl. That thing, you know, you're not supposed to say super. You know how that works. Anyway, so anyway, um, so uh, Conqueror Series, we're meeting at 2 o'clock, 2 to 4. Uh, we'll try to get you out right at 4 so you guys can go. Um, but it all depends on your all's conversations and how that works. So be here at 2 o'clock. I think that should give you plenty of time to take your family to get something to eat and then come on back um, on there. Also, um, let's see. A State of the Lighthouse meeting is coming on March 1st. Those of you who are connection class teachers or ministry heads, I need you to get your reports to me for the State of the Lighthouse. Um, I need it by the, what did I say, the 15th, um, preferably by email. If not, hard copy is fine, but I'd prefer it by email. And um, we can get that in. And then I'll be passing those reports out um, the last weekend of February for everybody to read. And then we will be talking about them on March 1st. There will also be a potluck dinner. So more details on that to come. And last but not least, this is a public service announcement for all those who are cleaning the church. Uh, we've been noticing lately there's a lot of trash being left over after service. There's bottles of water. There's coffee cups. There's stuff laying in the seats. There's. Can you just police yourself and help pick us up? That's all we're asking. Not a big deal. But if you could do that, that would help those who are cleaning up and all that stuff. All right. Everything good there? All right. And also, I think KCA's got a uh, open house on... All right, so KCA, if you'd like to go, that information, she's got some more information on that. All right, well, if you grab your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, um, we are going to try to delve into some of this that we didn't get to last week. And um, really what what we started talking about, and I kind of opened it, was about this Christian life that we've all been told, and we've all heard it, that once you're a follower of Christ, Everything, and I'm going to use a phrase that I made up on accident, is rosy fine candy. All right? That it's all good. 
it's the way it is. It's, 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 you know, once you have that, you're going to have prosperity and all that. But those of us who've actually lived life, we know better. Amen. There are problems in the Christian life. Um, things aren't always easier. Sometimes I think, uh, I was in a connection class today, and sometimes things are harder that we're supposed to do, um, and those kind of things. So it's really difficult um, for us to see this. It's not always about wealth and power and money. It's usually about giving away. It's usually about decreasing self so that you can increase someone else. And that's what this life is about. And what I'd like to do is through this the next couple s- sermons, I want to give you a tool Kind of like this. Now, I did not know what this was. We had an, this was a large ergonomically correct pizza peel. Look like. Um, or an ergonomically correct paddle for parents. That way you don't get uh, carpal tunnel syndrome from paddling your kids. Um, but really what this is, is it's a, it's an oar, and it's what they call a power stroke. And I'm going to put my mic down and kind of demonstrate how this works. Not that I know anything about. Last time I got into a canoe, you asked my wife what happened. <laughs> I know, that was years ago. Get over it. I know. Okay, but anyway, let me, let me explain it. So I'm going to do it without the mic. I know the guys at the recording are loving this. But it's, it's a power stroke. You see, it fits. And you can just dig down and it's an easier movement. And it goes through. That's what... I want this to be for you. As we learn what this is supposed to be, following Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, it's a power stroke to get you through life's hard spots. I mean, wouldn't it be good if we could just power through it in the name of Jesus instead of getting stuck? And, and that's really what this is about. And so I better put this back or I'm going to trip over it. Um, that's really what this is about. So really what I want to do in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, um, I want to pick up in verse 2. And we're probably not going to get very far because the first two words in the Holman that I have, there's different versions of the Holman out there, but the one that I has, verse 2 says, accept us. And I want to stop there because, you know, there's a lot in that, those, those two words, accept us. Let's take a little quick review what's going on. Paul has been writing letters to the church of, of Corinth because there was a problem in the church. There was many problems in the church, but there was a specific problem in the church. And so Paul wrote the first letter to address these things. And when he addressed these things, um, there was uh, at first a negative reaction to his letter because pretty much he was calling the church out on the carpet for several things. They needed some correction. They needed some of these things. Have you ever been there? And so because the Lord is a loving God and he corrects those he loves, he often sends people into our lives to correct us. How many have been corrected? (laughs) Yeah. At first it starts out with your parents. Those seem to be the major correctors of your life. Then it goes on, and as you get older, you get other people like your bosses and (laughs) those things. But there to correct you in what you're doing. They're your authority. That's the way it is. And so he wrote to them and saying this, and he was going through, and it was a hardship for him. Now remember, I'm going to tell you this. Being, being a leader and having to correct is not an easy task. Doing it in love and these things, and it's hard. And Paul's writing this, and he's trying to, he's trying to say, and so in, in this letter, he's, he's really looking at them, and he's saying, look, I know what I wrote before. It was hard for you to hear. It was, it was whatever, but accept us. That phrase, accept us, isn't that reconciliation statement? Because we've been talking about this ministry of reconciliation. We've been talking about that our purpose in the new covenant or this new ministry is to reconcile people unto God and then people here. We are supposed to be reconciled here and to God. It's about loving God and loving others. So when we, when we do this and he says accept us, what he's saying is accept us because, because we need to be reconciled to one another. So I got, this, I got this as I'm looking at these two words and I'm going, man... Paul was writing about hard things because he had to confront the church about how thing that they were allowing something in their church that was not even right in their prevailing culture. But what about stuff that is right in the prevailing culture that we accept as okay? 
And he, I mean, this is what he's talking about. And he's getting really, I could tell he's like, okay, look, accept us. But I got to think even more about it. Because it's not just accepting the things that are of the prevailing culture outside the church. But church, we have to be on guard not to accept things that are prevailing culture in the church that go against what God wants us to do. And we accept these things sometimes. The other thing is, is then I got to thinking, and this, I'm, you're just going on the rabbit trail of my life, so enjoy. So I'm thinking about these things, and then I'm going, okay, you know what else? Here's the thing, is how many times have we run into correction, or we've run into hardship, or we've run into a struggle, and we've decided we're not going to accept what this is, and we're going to fight tooth and nail, and we don't accept the leading and teaching of God. In my life, there have been so many times when God has been trying to teach me, and I said, no. How many have been there? Come on. Some of you are honest. I appreciate that. Other years, you'll come along in time. <laughs> I've been there. No, God, I do not want to learn this lesson. I, don't, I, God, I know I've walked down this road a hundred times, God, in the same thing, but I'm not going to learn this lesson because I don't want to. He says, fine. At some point, folks, in our maturity and walking in Christ, we are going to need to learn to accept the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked a lot about surrendering. And, and because of the way the Holy Spirit worked, there was a lot of people surrendering things. The altars were full. We were surrendering things. Because I think this is it. Until we learn to surrender, we can't learn to accept the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes that teaching of the Holy Spirit not only comes from the Word, not only comes from just Him directly speaking to you, but the teaching of the Holy Spirit at times comes from somebody else. Have you noticed how God and Jesus, in all the scriptures, He never really intended to do it all by Himself? He always had someone with Him to help. Paul is one of those people in scripture where He was trying to teach them. He says, Accept us. Accept our teaching. Accept what we're doing. Let us be reconciled to this. Be reconciled to the hardship that you're facing because there's something in it for you. Then he goes on, and, he's, and, and then I, I ask this question. Okay, so he says accept them. He's writing these hard things He's about all this stuff. Okay, accept it. I'm going to do this. And then he goes on to say this. We have wronged no one. We've corrupted no one, defrauded no one. And then I'm thinking, Wow. This is, gets hard. <laughs> because there are times when God is speaking to me and say, hey, I need you to go to my brother. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out Henry because I can. But to say that there's something that Henry has got going on in his life. And I know. And God's telling me, hey, you know what? You need to go to that brother. And it's funny. And this is just... <laughs> it's kind of what he taught on in connection class today. I need, I need to talk to you about this. I need to love you in this, but this is what's going on, and, and, and this is what I see. But how many times, though, do we not do this because we are questioning, have I wronged him? Because if I've wronged him, he's not going to take that correction. Have I told him a non-truth? Have I corrupted him? In other words, wronged him, how I've treated him. Have I went out of my way to put myself before him? Have I... Um, have I corrupted him in, in, and really that is, is how have I been wholehearted with him? Or has my heart been hardened towards him? And then there are other ones, have I defrauded him? Have I verbally gave him the wrong information at times? And then we stop because we are so critical of ourselves. Listen, church, we are so critical of ourselves. How many people have I heard that says, I, I don't have any place to tell you this? What I'm trying to get at is in the body of Christ, we are to keep each other accountable. We, and that's what Paul's doing. But we need to walk with confidence. This is a challenge for us. Can we sit here and say, I have wronged no one. I have defrauded no one. I have corrupted no one. Or have we put ourselves in front? Because I'm going to tell you this. If you do something out of selfish ambition you are doing all three of those things. 
Because how is that loving God and loving others? Now, Paul's saying, accept this. I've done this. And then he says, look, I don't say these things to condemn you. He says, I've already said to you that you are in our hearts to live and to die together. Oh, that challenged me. When I look across at the people, it in my heart, am I willing to live with you and die with you? I mean, that's how we're supposed to be together. The church is supposed to be that strong. We're supposed to have that kind of a bond. Do you know what? It doesn't matter what our race is, our, our, our country of origin. It doesn't matter what we look like, what we sound like, what we do, what our social economical status is. What matters is, is that we are all under the banner of Jesus Christ. And in my heart, I should love you as much that I want to live with you and I want to die with you. This is contrary to what is prevailing in our culture today. And this is when it gets sticky. Because this is when it gets, this is when we start living in chaos. Because when we step forward to live like this with somebody, culture tells us, don't do it. Don't forgive. Don't give of yourself. You, you just stay where you just protect yourself. You put all your stuff in a row. It's all about you, and this is what it is. And how is that accepting? So, okay, all right. He's telling us in our hearts to live like this, to live together and to die like this. But hang on just a second. He takes it a step farther. Are you ready for this? And four, he says, I have great confidence in you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement. I am overcome with joy in all our afflictions. Whoa. <laughs> That's hard. Because what Paul's saying is, okay, yeah, you got to have in your heart to live and, and this, but now what you need to do is you need to look at your brother and you need to say, I'm encouraged by you. You encourage me. Why? Because I trust that the Holy Spirit is working in you and you are not the same as you were yesterday because you are putting Jesus first in your life. I'm encouraged. I am proud of you. I am, I am just, I know you're struggling right now. I know it's hard, but I'm proud of you. You are digging in the trenches. You are doing, you're fighting the fight. I know you're struggling in the fight and you may feel like you're wounded and you may feel like no one understands, but let me tell you, brother, I'm right with you. I know where you're at. I know it hurts, but I am proud of you. I am filled with encouragement because I'm encouraged in the fact that I know that God's not through with you, just like he's not through with me. And as a matter of fact, I am filled and I'm overcome with joy in all our afflictions. And you notice the word are in there. In other words, what he's saying is, let me walk in your shoes with you. Your affliction is my affliction. But I'm going to count it all joy, brothers, when I find myself in these trials and tribulations because let me tell you something. God is not done with us. He says in verse 5, in fact, we'd come into Mes uh, Mes Macedonia, we had no rest. Instead, we were troubled in every way. Conflicts on the outside, fears inside, how many have been there? This is Paul now. This is the guy that if we could put in a superhero uniform, we would. Wouldn't we? This is Paul. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. He laid out most of our doctrine. And listen to what he's saying. He's saying, look, life for me sometimes isn't all bed of roses here. I don't know if you, can you identify with Paul there? Have you ever had a part of your life that you've had trouble in every way? <sighs> okay, if you're married, I know you've had conflicts on the outside. If you have any kind of relationships, you've had conflict, amen? And it's on the outside and it hurts. But the worst one in this whole thing is he says, yes, I've had these things. I've had conflict on the outside. I've had trouble in every way. But man, I have had fear on the inside. 
This is Paul. This is the guy who got stoned and was thrown off the, the thing and he walked, got up and he went back into town and said, hey, you didn't hear what I said. Fear on the inside. How many, and I'm going to tell you this, I really believe this is an echid, ep, that word, an epidemic in the church. Listen, church, if you don't hear anything else that I say to you today, this is hugely important. This is, this is what's going on. We have a bunch of people who know Jesus but are living with a fear on the inside that God's not going to come through, that God's promises aren't going to be fulfilled. We read the promises in Scripture and we say, that's for somebody else and not for me. What would happen if we begin to live without fear? What if we begin to live that says, those promises in there, if they're for anybody, they're for me. But the reason we fear, and, 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 and uh, this is just, the, the reason we fear, and the reason we get stuck and we don't power through in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, because <clears throat> maybe some of us are sitting there going, but you don't know who I really am. And if, and God does. And so, because he knows who I really am, I don't think he's going to come through because he sees that dark place in my life. He sees that part I haven't surrendered. He sees that part. And I'm here to tell you today, that's, that's why you shouldn't fear, because he does see it, and he does care, and he will take it. He will make it his own. We don't have to live in fear of what the future is going to hold, because God's got this. I don't know whatever situation you are, God's got this. If we surrender like we did last week, if we surrender to him and we say, okay, Holy Spirit, you have in, let me be reconciled to you in this area of my life. You see, we can be reconciled in certain areas of our lives and not in others. That's why we get stuck in the past. And usually the reason we get stuck in the past is due to fear. Because if I forgive, then maybe I'm going to say that's okay. Or if I'm, you know what I'm saying? Come on. You, we can't get stuck there. We've got to power through with the Holy Spirit and, and, and what this is about. This is all about reconciliation. Because in the middle of the struggle, there is still joy. In the middle of the grief, there is still joy. Because nothing and nobody can take that away from you. You may be walking this road with Jesus and it may be a struggle, but let me tell you something, in that struggle, there is still joy. Do you guys know the joy of the Lord? Brian does. I said, you guys know the joy of the Lord. So it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you. You know the joy of the Lord. Now, it's easy to say that in a congregation full of like-minded people, but you go to work and your boss jumps at you. Are you going to know that there is joy in the Lord? He says, man, when we came into this place, we had no rest. I've been there. Where I feel like I've had no rest. I've watched people who have lived life without getting rest. And any time, I, I find it interesting that he starts out those things. We're in trouble in every way. We're in conflicts on the outside and fears on the inside because they had no rest. Now, this works physically, does it not? But I want to talk to you, not only spiritually, we've got to take care of ourselves and make sure we're getting rest, but I also want to talk to you about emotional and spiritual things. I want to talk to you about the fact that Jesus wants you to rest in him. 
So if we rest in him and we're powering through with the Holy Spirit, those things won't overtake us or overshadow us. We will be overcome with the joy that is in the Lord. And when once we get that going, we can, I'm telling you what, we can power through this. Listen to what he says. But God who comforts the humble. He's saying this is where it was. I felt like I didn't have any rest. I had all this trouble. I had conflicts on the outside. I had fears going on on the inside. But God showed up because I humbled myself before him. And I said, I can't do this alone. We want to know why God isn't comforting us. Check how humble you're being to him. God is the God who comforts the humble. He said he comforted us by the arrival of Titus. Remember in five or six, I can't remember, it seemed like there was this, maybe it was four, where there was all of a sudden there was like this little bit of scripture and he goes, I'm looking for Titus, but he hasn't showed up yet. You think Paul was saying, I need some comfort. I need some comfort. I need someone to come. And so God sent Titus. What's so important about Titus? Well, Titus was the guy who went to the Corinth church after Paul wrote his first letter to them. It was Titus who went on Paul's behalf to check up and see what was going on in the church. And he hadn't heard. Paul is freaking out. Titus hasn't texted me and told me what was going down. If he's not texting me, did they throw him out of the church? Did they stone him? I mean, they were, the letter I wrote, they could have been really mad at me, and now poor Titus is taking the brunt. But Titus shows up. And I don't want us to miss this. Titus shows up. He says in seven, and not only by his arrival was he comforted, but also by the comfort he received from you. What? What? Titus shows up on the scene and says, oh, Paul, you know that letter that you wrote to the Corinthian church? And if I was Titus, I would have been, you know that letter? Yeah, well. Paul's going, tell me. Tells me, tells Paul, when I got to the church, they accepted me and they comforted me because I was weary from his trip. Because traveling back in those days was not an easy thing. We think it's bad when we fly and we got to take off our shoes and stuff, but at least we're not walking. Yes, they comforted me. They provided for me. That word comfort is, is in, the origin, in the Greek is saying they provided for me. They took care of my needs. But that's not why he was really comforted. I mean, he was comforted by that fact because, you know, if I send my son to your house and you comfort him and you provide for him, that makes me know that he's safe, Right? Oh, this is a side note. But you know when God sends you, it's like our father is sending his kid to go take care of another one of his kids. How we doing? How we doing? He says, so not only by his arrival, but why he received from you. He told us about your, and listen to what he says, your deep longing your sorrow, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoice even more. For even if I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. Well, okay, he says, even though I did regret it for a little while. (laughs) He goes, now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God willed, so that you didn't experience any loss from us what is he saying 
This is huge. He's saying, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was comforted by the fact that he showed up. But, but let me tell you something. What really got to me in all this stuff was he told me that the letter caused you to be repentant of what was going on in, your, in the body of Christ. Now, obviously, we know it's not all the way fixed yet because we can read on, right? He says, okay, good, but let's keep walking down this road because this is our tendency. It's when we are corrected, we take the first step and then we stop. Instead, of we keep walking in that correction, amen? And he's saying, okay, and he was, so we know that, but listen to what's going on. And let me ask you this. Now, these are tough questions, but do you have a deep longing? What does that mean? He's referring to the deep longing of who Jesus is. Is that a character trait of yours? The reason I have to ask you this question is because if, if we're going to face this life as a follower of Jesus, which can be hard at times, and difficult, and heartaches, and sorrows, and troubles on the outside, and fears on the inside, and all these things. Let me ask you this. Is this causing you to have a deep longing for who Jesus is? If one thing could be said of you, would it be, Brian, out of all the things, he had a deep longing for who Jesus is. He wanted to know his rabbi, and he wanted to be like his rabbi Yeshua. Do you have a deep longing for what it is of God? Do you have a deep longing to power through the stuff of life? Or are we one of those who goes, I really don't want to know anymore because what I've known already seems hard and I don't want to be. I, I. How about, he says... <laughs> And this seems weird to us, but he was comforted by not only his deep longing, but by their sorrow. When you don't follow your rabbi, are you heartbroken? Does the sin of your life, a lot of churches are scared to use the word sin. I am not. Because we all do it. And I've all got stuff, we all got stuff that we need to give over but does that sin break your heart? Or do you do, eh, everybody else has got it. Everybody else is, this is normal. This is what prevailing culture says, so it's okay. Or do you look at your life and it breaks your heart? Or how about you just breaks your heart when you see injustice? When someone brings up orphans, it breaks your heart. When someone brings up human trafficking, it breaks your heart because God's people are being treated that way. Where is it that, that, that it's okay? And, and, and okay, this is, I got I to gotta stop something right here. We in the church are so guilty of saying things that we don't realize. Well, in heaven there's no sorrow. Are you telling me that God is not grieved by our sin? It says that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on as we run this race. Are you telling us that that cloud of witnesses doesn't get grieved when we step off the track and we quit running because it's too hard? Yeah, every tear will be wiped away because we will at that moment, in a twinkling of an eye, when I'm standing in front of my Rabbi Yeshua, I will know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he has got this because I'm with him. <laughs> so yeah, okay, that tear is gone. But now, what, what is the legacy I live behind? Am I going to, this is important stuff. You see, we don't think about this when we're going through all the hardships of life. We don't think about this. We, we get so wrapped up in the now that we forget. You know what? I, being a parent really changed my life. And I'm going to say being a parent brought me closer to Jesus than anything else. But at times, it's also taken me farther away from Jesus. Just kidding. Uh, <clears throat> because I realized something. <clears throat> how I respond to this situation, my kids are watching me, and that's how they're going to respond. Church, 
If we are going to send the next generation on as followers of our Rabbi Yeshua, we got some generational curses that got to be broken. We have to stand and teach our kids, guess what? Life sometimes is hard, but I'm going to show you by the way I live my life. I'm going to power through with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to go over those white rotters, and we're going to go down the hard things, and we're going to come out on the other side joy at the end of the race because we have finished it. And we think about it took me having a kid to do that. But I want you to know, and I've said this a hundred times from this pulpit, everybody has somebody that's watching them. You have children watching you. Children, they could be older than you, but they're still watching you. And they're following you and how you respond. Godly grief produces repentance, not to be regretted, leading to salvation, but worldly grief produces death. And I begin to think, and I want to close with this, I begin to think because I've been talking about dying to self, right? I mean, really, Reconciliation is about dying to self, right? I mean, it is. I got to put myself aside so that I can be reconciled. I mean, it's, it's, it's all it is. It all comes together. But, but I got thinking. The reason sometimes we don't die to self or we don't do this is because we have this grief that I have to give up of myself and it's a worldly grief and it produces death. Doesn't that match what the Bible teaches about once we are dragged in way and enticed by our own evil desires, that that produces sin, and once that sin is fully grown, it produces death. Maybe some of us over the last several weeks have been hearing this dying to self. And maybe, maybe the first time you heard that, you said, yeah, maybe that's something I should try, and you did that, but it grieved you because it got hard. <laughs> She said, I'm not doing that anymore. That hurts too much. Well, maybe today, maybe something said, maybe something read, maybe you realize fear is controlling. But maybe today, you could say, you know what? I want to die to self. I want to put God before anything else in my life. I want God to be my number one. And I want a deep longing for him. And when I sin, I want to be sorry. I want to have sorrow. I want to have a godly grief that leads me. The Holman said salvation. But really what that brings, it brings me to joy. Because I know God's got me in the palm of his hand and nothing can remove me. Yeah, that, that statement we usually refer to as salvation. But I think we tend to forget that he were still in his hand. And that no matter what the affliction is, there's joy because my Abba Father, my Daddy is holding me through this. He's carrying me through it. And on the other side of this desert, on the other side of this, I realized that it hadn't been me at all. It was all him. Verse 11 says, For consider how much diligence this very thing, this grieving as God wills, has produced in you. 
What a desire to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what deep longing, what zeal, what justice. In every way you showed yourselves to be pure in this matter. God wants to power you through and it all started on a cross. As we prepare to have communion together, I, every, every time we, I give you kind of a, a different thing to think about, and, and today, today I want you to think about joy. Today I want you to think about when you take the bread, and you take the juice, I want you to think about the joy that we find in the affliction of Jesus Christ. So well, that's kind of strange, isn't it? No. Because it is that joy that is our foundation of understanding that I can make it too. For I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. It is Jesus Christ that lives within me. The afflictions and the troubles and the conflicts and the fears and all these things cannot stand up against the power of what my Jesus did on the cross. And matter of fact, the world can throw that, yeah, but your Savior went to the cross and he died and it doesn't stop there because my Savior went there and the joy comes in the morning referring to the day that that stone rolled away and my Jesus, my Rabbi Yeshua, walked out Messiah Jesus. We can't let things get in the way of this. February 15th, Lent starts. And last year I told you that, that I had given up something for Lent and, I've, and I went through the Lent season. I plan to do it again this year. I want, I encourage all of you to do that. Why? It, isn't that what the Catholic Church does? Yes, it is, but it's okay. Because I believe that we need to sacrifice something for Jesus. And maybe during this time, this, this 40 days before resurrection, hey, I got to tell you I'm excited because resurrection day is right around the corner. And you see, and I, what I would like you to do, it starts on the 15th, it's a Wednesday. Youth group, I challenge you guys, leaders, I challenge you to challenge them to give something up for Lent. And begin to teach that it's okay for us to sacrifice and give of ourselves and die to self for the cause of Christ. And once we do that, we're going to go into this, and I'm so excited. I don't know where God, how God's going to end Corinthians, but what I'm excited about is I'm going to be able to take you on the Sundays follow, getting up to Resurrection Day. We are going to look at some of the stories and of what Jesus has done when he was here. And I'm so excited because we're going to look at our rabbi, and we're going to say, I want to be like our rabbi. But it all starts because he didn't stay on the cross. It all is because he rose again. So as you come, it's the joy that we're seeking. It's the joy that we find here. There is the joy in the bread of reconciliation. Here at the church, everybody's welcome to have communion. One thing we ask is, and I say this every time, it's so important, is that if you come and you have aught with your brother, the scripture says, you have something that you need to talk about. You all know what ought is. It's a weird word, but we know what it is. You may not know that it was the word ought, but you know when you walked in the door, God already began to speak to you. And you know why? Because that's been my prayer all week, because communion was coming. <sighs> need you. If you've got something that you need to talk to with somebody, come, take a little piece off the bread of reconciliation and go and be reconciled to one another so that you can come back and you can enjoy communion with the right attitude so that you can be not cursing, uh, putting a heap of curse on yourself, but that so you can understand this joy. So that you can understand this joy. Today is a day of joy. I know you're going through something in your life. 
Every one of us has something. Count it all joy. Because if God's teaching you, it's going to lead you to salvation. <laughs> it's going to lead you closer to him, and that's what it's all about. All right. I didn't ask you, but Paul and Randall, would you come host this table for me? Ted and Joyce, would you host this table for me? What I ask is you is we're going to go through, we're going to sing this beautiful song called Lamb of God. But as God leads you to come and, and, and take communion, I ask that you just come along the outside, come this way, and then head back to your seat so we can close out together. Find the joy of the Lord. Find the joy of the Lord today. Celebrate with him. <laughs>